Hey, I, I love uh, what CJ was saying this morning, and I think it ties in a little bit with my message this morning. We do not have to fear because we have a good shepherd, amen? And a shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A shepherd takes care of his sheep, amen? Like, we don't have to be afraid because our shepherd is going to take care of us, and he's going to look out for all of our needs. Uh, so this morning we're going to be looking at a passage talking about that. I'm going to give a little pitch this morning for my favorite Christmas gift. I know that, uh, well, one of my favorite Christmas gifts right here. Uh, if you want to look these up, you can buy them. They're called Scripture Journal Bibles. And uh, so each book of the New Testament has one of these. And so this is the Gospel of John, because we'll be in John chapter 10, if you want to go ahead and flip there this morning. But basically what it has is a one, shot, one side is your Scripture, and the other side is a blank page for you to take notes. Uh, right there beside that scripture so that you can begin to comprehend and begin to uh, just note take every single chapter of the New Testament. Amen. So I started using those this week, so I got it up here uh, ready just in case I need it for the sermon. But that's a great tool uh, for your devotional time, for uh, Sunday morning taking notes, whatever it may be. They're a little bit pricey, but, um, but they'll help you in that relationship, that devotional relationship with God's Word. Amen. And so that's very important. Uh, so this morning I've entitled my message, The Giving Shepherd. And so we'll be in John chapter 10, if you want to go ahead and flip to John chapter 10. Um, but the message this morning is The Giving Shepherd. And how many of you have ever heard this statement before? And it's, it's good that the kids are in here this morning. And don't be worried if your kids start screaming, it's all right, right? It's good. Uh, it's, it's a good morning. So how many of you in this room have ever heard this before or said this before? I just want my kids to have a better life than I have. Right? If we had a dime for every time we heard that, we'd be pretty rich. Right? People say it all the time. I just want my kids to have a better life than what I had. I just want my kids to have a great life. I want them to have everything. That's why I spoil them. That's why I give them everything. I want them to have the best life. And as parents, I know that you do. You want your kids to have something more than what you had. You want them to have the best possible life. You know who else wants that for you and your children? Jesus. Jesus wants you to have the best life. He wants you to have the best life. He is a giving shepherd. And so we're going to dive into John chapter 10 this morning. But before we get there, I just want to just kind of paint a picture here for you of the Gospel of John is one of the most important books in the Bible. They're all important, but the Gospel of John is so interesting it's the first book that I point people to. So if, you, like, if you're a new believer in Christ, I point people to read the Gospel of John because it's going to tell you exactly who Jesus is in a lot more blunt ways than the other Gospels. Right? John doesn't hold anything back. John just tells you right up front who Jesus is over and over and over again. Why? Because John had this had a longer time to comprehend and to understand and to, to live in this world after Jesus ascended into heaven. John spent a lot more time. All the other apostles died a martyr's death. Every one of them. Every one of them died for Jesus. And they all died pretty early. Right? They all died pretty early. Like, like most of the Gospels are, are written... Uh, but the Gospels are written around 60, something like that. Paul's letters are written in the 40s and 50s. And, and quickly after that, apostles begin to die. But the apostle John lived the longest out of every one of the disciples of Jesus. All right? He lived the longest. He probably died somewhere around 100 A.D., which means if Jesus died somewhere roughly around 30, he had about 70 years to sit and to comprehend and to understand who this Jesus was that he spent three and a half years with. Who this Jesus was that he saw die on the cross when he's standing right beside Jesus' mother, right? This is the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is standing beside the mother of Christ, Mary, standing beside her when Jesus dies. This is the same disciple that Jesus said, take care of my mother too. This is the same disciple who saw Jesus not only die on the cross, but be buried and then be raised on the third day. This is that disciple who saw Jesus ascend into heaven after 40 days ministering in a resurrected body. This is that apostle. And he had 70 years or so to reflect on this side of heaven about who Jesus was. 
So I want to think about, think about John, think about that, having 70 years to just begin to prepare and digest and to write about this Jesus. Now, did that mean John had an easy life because he was, didn't die a martyr's death? No, he was burned in bur burning oil, boiling oil, burned, put in boiling oil because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't have it easy. He was exiled to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. This John that we're talking about wrote five books in the New Testament for us to read. First, second, and third John, the book of Revelation and the gospel of John, Right? The, this John that we're about to read, he had a lot to comprehend. But I love John because this, may, this time that John had makes his gospel very unique. It makes it very unique because he, he reorders things, right? He changes the order of stuff. He's writing his own gospel. It's way different than the other three, right? The other three are all really similar, have most of the same stories. The gospel of John's a little bit different. Why? He had more time to prepare and think about this. And I love John because he's blunt. Jesus is God. You're going to get that from the Gospel of John. Jesus is the same as the Father. He's equal. The Father and Jesus are one. That's the theme throughout John, right? He's really, really blunt. And I love when we get to John chapter 10 and we start to read this text this morning. John chapter 10. It starts in verse, starting in verse 1, starts here. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. So stop there for just a second. A sheepfold would have been a sheep pen. Normally, it would have been backed up probably to a sheer kind of rock cliff. That way, one side's already taken care of, right? One side's taken care of. There's nothing, nothing coming from that direction, right? And then they would have the other three sides gated off or, or, or walled off. And really in the background, you can see kind of an ancient sheepfold there on the background of where the slides are. But, so they would have those blocked off, and they would have one gate, right? They would have one gate where the shepherds would enter. And I want you to see for a second, this is probably, this reference in John 10 is probably a community sheepfold, which means various shepherds would have their sheep there. Not just one shepherd, but various shepherds from the community would all have their sheep there, and their sheep would be intermingled, okay? You think about that and picture that as we're going through John chapter 10, that this is a community sheepfold. There's a bunch of sheep in there. You have a sheep, you're a shepherd. You have your sheep there. I'm a shepherd. I have my sheep there. They're all intermingled, okay? You with me? Sheepfold. The one who enters by the door, that's the shepherd. If you enter some other way, you're a thief and a robber, right? Thief just stealing something. A robber is somebody who's violent. So he's playing on this idea of a violent thief. Thief and a robber. Okay? So imagine that community sheepfold as we go through this story. Here we go. Let's keep on going, starting in verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. They would probably pay somebody throughout the night, various times, to be watching that gate. Right? To be guarding that gate to where nobody comes and steals anything or nobody tries to get into that sheep fold. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Okay, let's just stop there for just a second. A couple things really stick out to me as we go through this text. Remember, this is a community sheepfold. Community sheepfold. So if one shepherd enters into the gate and begins to speak, what sheep are going to listen to that voice? His sheep. But if another shepherd comes into that gate and begins to speak, what sheep are going to listen to his voice? Not that other shepherd's sheep. His sheep, and they're all intermingled, but they will begin to separate when they hear the voice of their owner or their master or their shepherd. There's two really big themes here in the Gospel of John, right, that, that are in this text right here specifically, right? Number one, right, right here in this text, hearing the voice of God, hearing the voice of the shepherd, okay? Just think about that as we're going through the text. 
Second is this, in the, in the gospel of John, over and over and over again, people are going to get confused and they're not going to understand stuff. And then Jesus is going to come back on the flip side of that and he's just going to say it really bluntly, right? So just notice here, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. Jesus doesn't say who the shepherd is, does he? He doesn't just come out and say who the shepherd is. This shepherd is ambiguous, right? It could be anybody. Who is the shepherd in the story? Jesus is making this story up. Who's the shepherd? Who are the sheep? Who's the gatekeeper? Right? And so they are confused by this story because Jesus doesn't just come out and say it. Right? He doesn't just come out bluntly and say it. And so many times throughout the Gospel of John, people are going to be really confused, and they're not going to understand something. And then right after that, Jesus is going to say, okay, since you didn't understand that, here it is, right? Sometimes we need that from God, amen? Sometimes I need that from God when I'm reading through the Bible and I'm like, I don't understand this, God. And then like the next verse, he's like, here's what it means. Jesus does that, right? His disciples do this often. His disciples don't understand and Jesus has to go, you don't understand what I'm talking about? Are you serious? Right? Any, any parents ever had to do that to your kids, <laughs> right? You don't understand what I'm talking about and you got to come back and you got to say it more clearly. Many of you are like, I wish you'd do that in your sermon sometimes. But Jesus is ambiguous. He doesn't tell us who the shepherd is, who the sheep are, who the gatekeeper is. And people don't understand. So what's he going to do right next? He's going to come out bluntly and say it. Here we go. Uh, so Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Right? Not hard to understand that one, is it? Who's the door of the sheep? Jesus is, who, not, not only Jesus, okay, not only G, is Jesus the door of the sheep, but God the Father is the door of the sheep, because he's using the divine name, okay? What is the divine name from the book of Exodus? Let's just go to, let's just flip to Exodus real quick. Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus says, um, Moses asked God, Moses asked God in Exodus chapter 3. Let me get there for just a second. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses asked God for his divine name, his name. What do, what do I tell the people your name is? What do I tell the people your name is? If they ask me what your name is, what do I tell them? And in three, Exodus 3, 13, Jesus says, or Moses starts off. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name, what shall I say to them? Okay? Jesus is playing on this, really. He's playing on this big time. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. He says, or no, sorry, verse 14 he ends. He said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay, so now we go back to the, to the gospel of John and we're reading through this and Jesus comes with this statement, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let's just keep on going through the text. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. What a text, right? Notice that 
Jesus says the words I am four times. He says, I am the door of the sheep. He goes back and says, I am the door. I am the, the shepherd, right? I am the good shepherd. And then he comes back again and says, I am the good shepherd. So four times Jesus uses the divine name to talk about himself. Why? John is really blunt here, right? If you're using the name of God, then you're saying you are God, right? The name of God is so special that you don't say it unless you're saying you are him. You with me there? So when Jesus says, I am the door, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the good shepherd, he is saying, I am the I am from Exodus. I am the God of Isaac and Jacob and Abraham. I am the God. I am Yahweh. I am a part of the divine being that created the heavens and the earth. I am him. What about the Father? Yes, he's I am too, right? The Father's I am, Jesus is I am. Which one of them is God? Yes, they both are God. And Jesus is claiming, John is, is writing here so bluntly, Jesus is God. He is divine. Notice here as well, that Jesus Remember, we've been talking about how the Old Testament and the New Testament all tie in together, amen? One story that leads to who? To Jesus. Everybody say one story. It's one story that leads to Jesus. So if we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, you don't have to flip there with me, I'm going to be there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's this young little boy who his dad's name is Jesse. And this young little boy is talking to the king, and the king is like, you can't go out and battle that giant. You can't go fight the giant. And that little, that, that young man, that young man looks at the king and he says, listen, I've been a shepherd for a long time, and my father's put me in charge of the sheep, and when a lion comes, I kill it. When an animal comes and they try to take my sheep, I'm willing to stand in front of that animal in between me and my sheep, and I kill it. I slay it, right? I can slay this giant because I've been fighting lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my, right? He says that to the king. He says, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because my God is on my side. And he, so Jesus is tying right in. This whole shepherd theme goes right back to David. It goes right back to Moses who stands before Pharaoh in Egypt with his rod and his staff. And when he, they leave out of Egypt, who is leading them? The shepherd is leading them. Who's the shepherd in Exodus? Moses. And Moses is leading his people to the promised land. And Moses is leading his people through the parted Red Sea. And God is saying, Moses is the shepherd and the sheep are following him. Jesus is tying all of this in and he's saying, I'm the good shepherd. I am the ultimate shepherd. I am the ultimate one. David, yeah, he was a, he was a shepherd, but he wasn't the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And I will literally lay my life down for the sheep. Right? Why? Because I have authority to do what I want to do, right? That's what he says. Like John just comes out and plainly says it to us. She comes out and plainly says it. Look at this last section of scripture. Or this middle section. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. In no other gospel is Jesus more blunt than saying, I'm going to die, but not only am I going to die, I'm going to be raised to new life, right? I'm going to be resurrected. Jesus is very plain. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Stop there for just a second. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He's talking to Jewish people. He's saying, I have other sheep. They're not Jewish. They're Gentile, but I'm going to call them as well. All nations, all people of races and colors, it doesn't matter. I have one fold. 
All those who believe in me, you'll be a part of the same fold. We'll be worshiping Jesus all together. We are this morning when people are gathered in churches all around the world, worshiping a resurrected Savior on a resurrection Sunday. One fold, and they will all listen to my voice. I must bring them also. They'll listen to my voice, so there'll be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. How blunt is that? Jesus says, I'm going to die, but not only am I going to die, I'm going to take my life up again. Why? Because I have authority. Nobody makes me lay down my life. No, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, when they try to charge me, when I stand before Pilate, nobody's going to take my life from me. I'm going to gladly give it up and lay it down. Jesus knew what was, what was happening, amen? He knew that he was going to die on the cross, but he knew also that he was going to be raised on the third day. And John makes this very plain. The other day I was watching a series it's on netflix it's like the bible series there's one season and when the first season ended i like cried because i was watching it it was it was cool i mean there's some stuff that's not like perfect right but who's going to make a movie that's going to be perfectly to every little detail that's in the, in the bible right and there's a lot of details we don't know the bible just gives us the details that these writers think we needed to know like john he's just giving us the details he thinks we need to know in order to believe in jesus right it's what he's given us. He's not given what Jesus ate every day, right? He's not worried about that, all right? So, so anyways, I was watching this series, and Jesus has died on the cross, and he's been buried, and the disciples and, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, are all gathered around, and they're all looking, and, and, and so just very few of them are looking at the other ones and saying, he promised he would rise. We are going to wait here for three days. He promised he would rise again. We're going to wait Right? And we, when we go back to the Gospel of John, John, John acts as if Jesus knew that he was going to die. But not only was he going to die, he was going to be raised. John acts like Jesus knew. Jesus says that I may take my life up again. He says it in the Gospel of John. Jesus knew. So this Gospel of John has these two themes that I really want you to understand. Really three themes I've already talked about. Number one is the name I am. The name I am, two themes, I am. This is happening throughout the whole Gospel of John. So when you see Jesus say, I am, circle it, highlight it, underline it, because it's important, right? He is saying to Jewish people, I am the God of Israel. He's claiming his divinity. Right? He does this in John chapter 5. He does this in John chapter 14, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's claiming divinity. He's claiming, when he says, I am, he's, he's going back to Exodus. And he's letting us know that his name is the same name. That when you say Yahweh, you're not only talking about the Father, but you're talking about Jesus. When you say, I am, in the book of Exodus, it's not only talking about the Father, it's talking about Jesus. And Paul says in the book of Colossians, that nothing was made or created without Jesus being a part of it, right? And we go back to Genesis, we got the Holy Spirit, and according to Paul, we have the Son there, and we have the Father there. The triune God is there at the beginning of creation, and Jesus is claiming divinity here. He says, I am. Second is this, throughout the whole Gospel of John, there's this theme of, do you hear my voice? Do you hear my voice? Do you hear my voice? Time and time again, that theme will come into play in the Gospel of John. I think that comes into play today. Do you hear God's voice? How do you hear it? How do you understand what God is trying to get you to do? I think we're going to get there in just a second. So last theme, I didn't put it up on the screen, but I was thinking about it this morning. The last theme is this. People are going to misunderstand, and then John is going to come back and say it bluntly. Jesus is going to come back and say it bluntly just like you saw in John chapter 10, right? He's going to come back and say it, because sometimes we need Jesus just to come out and say it, right? Why does Jesus tell parables? He says, I tell parables so that people will actually seek me, and some aren't going to understand them. I tell them so no, those people don't understand. That's why I tell them in parables. If they want to understand, they can understand. If you want to seek God, you will find him, amen? 
Jesus did that in his ministry. He made you seek him. But I really want to focus on one verse here this morning. That was just all extra stuff. Let's focus on really the main point this morning, right? You all got that for free. All right, here we go. John chapter 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That verse rocks me. Why? <laughs> don't, don't put the next slide just yet. That verse rocks me. Here's what Jesus is saying. Number one, he doesn't come out and tell us who the thief is. He doesn't come out and say, the Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy here. Later on, I think Paul says that, right? But Jesus doesn't come out and say it. He just says, the thief. So I think there could be various thieves trying to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Not only Satan, yes, Satan's one of them, the devil's one of them, but people in the world who are controlled by the world and the one who runs this world, they can try to steal, kill, and destroy your life too. Okay? So he doesn't come out and say who the thief is. He's kind of ambiguous there. But then he does come back and say this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, or that they, they, I came so they can have life, but not only so they can have life, they can have life more. That's really what he's saying, that they can have more life. They can have the most life. They can have abundant life, right? And so I want you to get this out of your mind. I was thinking about this this week. Most of us, when we think about eternal life, we only think of it as a, an after I die thing. Eternal life starts the moment you come to know Jesus. Are you with me? So when did my eternal life begin my eternal life began when I put my faith and trust in Jesus at that moment I had eternal life at that moment my eternal life began Jesus says you if you don't have me you don't have life you're dead in your trespasses and sins but once you come to know the son you have life amen your eternal life begins on this side of heaven on this side of eternal on this side of that that state that you think about all the time so this morning, I want you to think, do I have eternal life? Have I put my faith and trust in Jesus? If I have, my eternal life started that moment. How awesome is that? You're not as excited about that as I am. My eternal life with God started the moment I put my faith and trust in Jesus. My eternal life started. My abundant life started that moment. So when Jesus says this, he's not only talking about the next life that we talk about all the time, he must be talking about this world, this life too. When I come to know him, I have abundant life. So this is why this rocked me. This next question I began to ask myself. What does abundant life look like if the one who promised it died on a cross? I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute because it, it just hit me. And I began to ask this question. Okay, Jesus, you said that we have life, and not only do we have life, but we have abundant life. Other, other places in the Gospels, Jesus says, I want you to be a well, but I don't want you just to have some water in you. I want you to have living water that's flowing out of you. I want you to have that kind of life, amen? I want you to be that kind of well. So I began to ask this question, what does abundant life look like if the one who promised it died on a cross? Because Jesus promised abundant life and then he went and died. His life didn't look abundant to people in the world. The life of most of the apostles didn't look abundant to people of the world. The life of, of those apostles like Peter who was crucified upside down, that life doesn't look abundant. But Jesus looked at people and he said, I want you to have life, but I don't want you just to have life. I want you to have abundant life right now in this moment, in this present time. I want you to have abundant life. So what does it look like? What does abundant life look like if the person who promised it died on the cross. Let's just go through some of the things it doesn't look like. Ready? Write these down if you want. It doesn't look like all the Facebook posts you post. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about. The only thing people post is what they want you to see. 
that's not abundant life because all they're worried about is what other people think of them. And Jesus doesn't want you to be worried about what other people think of you. That's not abundant life. That's the spirit of fear. Because you're fearful of what other people think. And according to the song earlier, we're no longer slaves to that. Amen? That's self-centeredness. That's worried about me. And Jesus, from what anything that we read in all the Gospels, Jesus doesn't think abundant life is worried about you. Here's what Jesus doesn't also, this is not abundant life either. You have the people who post only the good stuff in their life, and you have people who are all the time whining and moaning all over social media, right? That's not abundant life either. Somewhere in the middle where we're honest about everything, and we don't care, like, I don't think you should post everything on Facebook anyways. I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you what I see. Like, when we look at people's social media feeds, they just put on there what they want you to see. And we look at it. Social media is so damaging. Do you know that every time you look at your phone, a release of dopamine happens in your brain? The same release, the same kind of thing that, that happens when when you, never mind, the same kind of thing that happens when you do that happens when you look at your cell phone. The same kind of, in, this, this is what's going on in your brain. This is why you look at your phone 50 million times a day like, oh look, I got Facebook notifications, right? It, they're, they're getting you. Do you know that Instagram will withhold likes from your post to keep you looking and looking and looking and looking? And then once you get so many, they'll put them all, they'll flood you with it. Why? Because now they got you. I got 27 likes all at one time. They got you. Put down the phone for a little bit. That's not abundant life. Constantly looking at our phones to see how many people have liked my post. And don't act like you ain't done it. Right? That's not abundant life. Well, Joe, you may not have. <laughs> Let's look at this. Abundant life doesn't look like possessions. Abundant life is not about how many Christmas gifts you got this year. Abundant life is not about any of that. Abundant life doesn't matter how many possessions you have, amen? Doesn't matter what car you drive, doesn't matter anything. It doesn't look like money. It's not what abundant life looks like. If it looked like money, then Jesus didn't live abundantly. If it looked like money, then the apostles didn't live abundantly. It doesn't have to include a spouse. If abundant life had to include a husband or a wife, then Jesus didn't have an abundant life. Because he didn't get married. If it doesn't, ha it doesn't have to include children. I was writing all these things down and I had to include that one today. It doesn't have to include children. If that's abundant life, then Jesus didn't have abundant life. He didn't have physical descendants. He had all of us. It doesn't have to look like a big house. It doesn't have to look like a perfect job. It doesn't look like a life without hardship. It doesn't look like a life without persecution. It doesn't look like the American dream. It doesn't look like living in America. It, it, if abundant life included any of those things or all of those things, then none of the apostles had abundant life, and Jesus didn't have abundant life. So what does abundant life look like then when the person who promised it died on the cross? What does abundant life look like if the person who promised it died on a cross? Write these things down. It is a life that starts now, number one. It is a life of purpose. It is a life where I live for something bigger than myself. It's not about self-centeredness. It's a life where I live for something bigger than me. It's a life of purpose. And Jesus, from the very moment he comes on the scene at what we just celebrated Christmas, from the very moment of his birth, we see him at 12 years old in the temple saying, I got to be in my father's house. From the moment he was born, he knew he had purpose. He knew it. He had 
purpose, and he had meaning, and he had a job to do. He had a purpose bigger than himself. It was the purpose given to him by his father, the same father who is our father. The same father of Jesus that gave him purpose wants to give me purpose. And my purpose is not a job. My purpose is not a spouse. My purpose is something bigger than that. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's taking the message that that people have a Savior who died on the cross with them to all nations. It's a purpose bigger than myself. It's a purpose given by the creator of the universe. There's nothing better than living for the purpose that he wants us to live for. Amen? That's purpose. So that means abundant life has purpose. Abundant life has purpose. I know what I'm supposed to do. And here's a calling from God. Think about this for a second. Your purpose must only align with his heart. Think about, write that down. The purpose that I have for my life must align with God's heart. That's it. That's the only requirement for purpose. The task that I want to do must align with his heart. So if you want to be a police officer, great. It must align with his heart. Does God's heart want to take care of people who are in trouble? Absolutely. But he wants you to share the gospel in that too, right? Is is your purpose to go overseas and be a missionary somewhere? Does that align with the heart of God? You better believe it, right? All it has to do is align with his heart. How do I know God's heart? I read his word and his word tells me his heart. His heart always has to do with other people and not myself. So I don't get it. I don't have a job so that I can make more money. I don't, that's not it. That's not purpose. Can you work in a factory and have purpose? You better believe it. Why? Because there's people in the factory that don't know Jesus. So whatever you do, you do it as if you're serving the Lord. That's what Paul says. So whatever it is, I find my purpose. I find purpose. That's abundant life when I have purpose. Second thing, it is a life of trust because the shepherd wants to be your shepherd. He wants to to be in front and you behind him saying, I'm following you wherever you go. I trust you. I don't, I, don't, I don't worry all the time because I trust him, right? Trust is a literal thing. Like, you have to do it. It's an action too, right? And faith and trust go hand in hand. So I, if I have faith in God, I must trust him. If I don't trust him in the literal things of life, then I don't have very much faith, amen? I don't because they go hand in hand. I've said this scenario or this situation before if you have choosing a babysitter to watch your kids you better choose them wisely amen right and so if i'm choosing a babysitter to watch my kids i'm going to choose one that i trust how do i know that i trust someone they prove that i can trust them right this week at church i had to try to prove i could trust somebody so there's, this, there's a homeless lady that came into the county and nobody else would help her. So I said, here's $50 to go get your down payment on a, a p- apartment in Meadowview. Our church did that. Here's $50. I'm going to give you $50 in cash. Bring me a receipt back and you can prove whether I trust you or not. She brought me a receipt back like in 30 minutes. Bam, she was back. I can trust her a little bit. It's just one step in the trust process. I can trust somebody. How do you know that you can trust a babysitter? They've proven you can trust them. Jesus has proven time and time and time again that you can trust him with every aspect of your life. God has proven it. He led the people out of hardship in Egypt. He led them Parted the, parted the Red Sea. He led them through that. They should have been able to trust him because he proved that they could, but yet they couldn't. They wandered around the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of trust in God. God has proven you can trust him. You just got to see it and begin to trust. Uh, abundant life is always a life where I trust God with every aspect of my life. I trust him. This one, it is a life of hope. 
An abundant life is a life of hope. It's a life where I can continue to do good things on this world because I have hope of the life that is to come. I have hope of the next stage in life. I have hope that this is not it, that there's something else bigger than this. So when Galatians says, in Galatians chapter 5, chapter 6, Paul says, don't grow weary of doing good, for in good time you will reap what you have sown. Amen? So I don't grow weary of doing good things for people in this life. Why? Because I know that I'm going to reap what I sow. That I have a hope of the next stage. I have a hope that when I leave this world, that I will be in the presence of Christ. I have the hope that one day when Christ comes back, he's going to give me a new body and I'm going to live on a new earth with him for all of eternity. Amen. I have a hope. And this life is not my hope. He is my hope. Amen. And what he has promised is my hope because I can trust him. I don't stop doing good things in this life because somebody hurt me. I don't grow weary of doing good because I have hope. I will reap what I so, amen. Lastly, it is a life of love. It is a life of love. It's a life of love. Where I love people and we live in a community of love where no matter what we love each other, no matter what we tell each other the truth, no matter what how hard it may be, I live in that type of love, amen. The same type of love that God wants us to live in as a community. Jesus says that you will know that they are my disciples. How? By the way that we love. An abundant life is going to have a lot of love in it. Amen? A lot of love. So what is your purpose? Are you trusting him in every aspect of your life? Do you have hope? If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then if you did, you have hope. And most of all, are you loving people? And are you loving God? Because if you are, that's what abundant life looks like, people. Amen? That's what abundant life looks like. It doesn't look like possessions. It doesn't look like a spouse. It doesn't look like money. It doesn't look like any of that. It doesn't look like living in America. It doesn't look like any of that stuff. It looks like those things. It looks like those things. Sounds like 1 Corinthians 13, really, honestly, now that I think about it. Faith, hope, and love, right? Those things. To many in this room, let's see, this is, what I, this is what I think. Jesus says, I want you to have life, but I want you to have life what? Abundant. I want you to have abundant life. Here's what I think many of us in this room, we're okay with living an okay life. We're okay with being okay. And that's how we live our lives. I just want an all right life. I just want an okay life. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I want you to have abundant life. I want you to have the most life. But many of us as Christians all around the world are just okay with being okay. I want an okay relationship with God. I want an okay relationship with my spouse. I want an okay relationship with my kid. I want an okay relationship with people in the church. I want an okay relationship with people outside the church. I just want to live okay. And we just go through the motions. We just live day to day, just walking around as if we're dead, but we're supposed to be alive. We're just living okay. And so one goal for us in 2019, this is a cliche thing to talk about 2019, the two days before it comes, but one goal for us in 2019 is we all need to stop being okay with okay. I'm tired of okay. I'm tired of being an okay church. I'm tired of preaching okay sermons. I'm tired of having an okay relationship with my wife. I'm tired of having an okay relationship with my children. I'm tired of having an okay relationship with people in the church. I'm tired of our elders being okay. I'm tired of our deacons being okay. I'm tired of our servers being okay. I'm tired of being okay. Are you tired of being okay? 
Jesus says, I want you to have life, but I don't want you just to have life. I want you to have abundant life. I'm tired of being okay. Many of you have been living okay for years. Okay in your job, right? Last time I checked, I'm a Christian. And Paul says, whatever you do, you do as if you're serving the Lord. God doesn't want you to be okay at your workplace. It doesn't mean he wants you working 150 hours a week and not spending time with your family. But when you're there, he wants you to work. Thessalonians says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Right? He wants you to be, he wants you to live a life of purpose and meaning. And that's abundant. He is tired of us being okay with okay. That goes for church, that goes for my relationships, that goes for my family, that goes for for my spouse, that goes for everything in my life. I'm tired of being okay with okay. I want abundant life. And God says that he's given me everything I need to have it. I don't know what the passage is off the top of my head. Normally I know a lot of passages off the top of my head. I don't know what this one is. But the Bible says that he's given you every gift that you need to have abundant life. He's given you every gift you need. Everything. You have it. Use it. And stop being okay with okay. I want abundant life. I want abundant life. And Jesus promised that he would give it to us. This side of death. This side of death. He wants to give us abundant life. So whatever you need to have it, let's do it, amen? Let's do that in 2019. I want to have abundant life. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much. And God, Lord, I am tired of being okay with okay. I'm tired of having an okay devotional life with you. God, I'm tired of our church being okay. God, I'm tired of our giving being okay. God, I'm tired of my relationship with my spouse being okay. God, I'm tired of my relationship with people in this building right now being okay. God, I'm tired with my job being okay. God, we're tired of being okay. Jesus, you promised abundant life. You promised a life of fullness. And that life doesn't have to include everything I think it needs to. God, I trust you. You give me that abundant life that you want me to have. I trust you and I know that an abundant life has to do with trust. I know that an abundant life has to do with hope. I know that abundant life has to do with how I love others more than I love myself because Jesus, that was one of his commands. I know my abundant life has to have purpose. And you've given me my purpose. Jesus, you've given me my purpose when you said I need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength. And I have to love my neighbor as myself. There's my purpose. Tired of walking through life. Being okay. God, I hope. I hope that I don't have to end this prayer saying, I'm tired of being okay. But I hope that I can end this prayer saying, we are tired of being okay. And you have given us everything we need to have an abundant life.